Welcome to the Money Tree Real Estate Investor Podcast, where we learn from real estate professionals across the industry. They will share about how they got into real estate, the big wins they have celebrated, the mistakes they have made along the way, and the advice they have for anyone following in their footsteps. Money really does grow on trees. Hey everybody, it's William Holland here for another episode of the Money Tree Real Estate Investor Podcast. I've got a great guest today, Mark Updegraff. Um, he lives in New York and he's doing a lot of great things in real estate these days. Mark, I know you didn't start out in real estate. Uh, what was your first career path? I studied uh, tech photo for my undergrad and that really combined math, science, as well as a part of the arts. You know, I had nature photography, studio photography, but then I also had like high speed photography, non-conventional imaging. So it was a very techy photo uh, degree and I loved it. It really gave me the ins and outs of the camera. You know, I was in the dark room processing film and, and making prints, uh, but then I was also in the studio setting up lighting and getting real creative shots, going out into nature and getting really creative shots. So it kind of combined the best of what I liked. I liked math and science, but I also love to be creative. So that was my undergrad degree. And I went out into industry and I realized that a bachelor's of science just didn't really pay that well, you know? So I, I figured I should go back, get another degree, make more money, right? That's what everybody says. Yes. So I went back and got an advanced degree, came back out into the job market. I was making, you know, probably 80% more than I was with my bachelor's of science. But honestly, it still wasn't what I expected. Um, but I knew I was young and I, I ran around and I started talking to all the different scientists in the labs. Um, you know, luckily when they hired us, they hired a bunch of grads and they pretty much gave us free reign. They said, go find the different scientists that you resonate with and, and work on their projects with them. Uh, so I found a couple that I really liked and I noticed that their labs were always empty and they were working by themselves. They were kind of like lone, lone wolves. And I knew that uh, one of the gentlemen was responsible for this really, really big contract that our company had every single year running and he had he was doing MATLAB programming, which is a mathematical program language that I was very familiar with from my studies. And um, you know, we talked, we became friends. And I asked him, you know, candidly, I was like, hey, you know, making 72 grand. I'm like, what can I expect if I'm here like you and I really give this thing my all? I mean, they got to be paying you so much money because you know, clearly you're the one that's responsible for this this program and there's nobody here helping you. So He's like, ah, honestly, Mark, no, I'm not even making a hundred grand. I've been here for decades. And he's like, they don't really pay their scientists that well. If you want to advance um, with monetarily in this organization, you got to get yourself into management. And, you know, I, by knowing my managers and kind of going through with them and, and going through the meetings and kind of looking at like, looking at what my career would look like on the management side, it just didn't really excite me. You know, it kind of just turned to turned their back on the science part of it. It was more about the numbers of what they were bringing in in revenue currently versus pushing the envelope forward on the experimental side and what, you know, what the world needs as far as new technology. And that's what I figured out with the scientists as well. They're, you know, they had a lot of really good novel ideas that I was helping them work with. But then when we went to the managers, the managers were like, no, nah, it's not proven. We have, we have this technology that's already making money. So we really don't want to devote any resources on this new stuff that you guys want to work on. Even though, you know, we thought that um, in the future, it could be a huge profit center. Uh, they just weren't interested in hearing that. So, you know, kind of having that like scientist background, but then going and, looking at what management would look like if I were to want to make more money. I just was pretty unhappy with how that whole dichotomy worked. And uh, we ended up losing the contract that my friend and colleague had been working on. And, you know, I, I'm probably to blame, honestly, you know, cause we had a lot of those heart to heart conversations and he ended up going to our competitor Raytheon. And when he went to Raytheon, we lost the contract. And now I can't prove any of this, but you know, I know that he wrote all that code and you know, I had helped him with it and I looked at it. And if you know coding, you know, a lot of it is just the code and then a comment, you know. So you can try to figure out if something goes wrong, mm -hmm. you can look at your mm -hmm. comment and try to figure out what happened. And he's got, you know, he's got thousands of pages of code to run this sophisticated imaging system that would fly, you know, in an airplane, it would take images of the earth. And then, you know, we were pretty much wow. looking for disturbed earth so we could save troops, right? So the, the U S government was really interested in it. If we could say, Hey, don't go over here. The troops are going to get blown up. They wanted that technology. And when he went to Raytheon, so did the contract. And that contract was literally $500 million. And when you take $500 million out of an organization, they're forced to lay some people off. 
in Rochester, it was 2000 plus people that all got laid off with uh, my, my similar degree, all based on this one contract. And, you know, I was, you know, last in first out. So I knew that there was, you know, 2000 people that had more experience than I did with a similar degree than I did. Plus uh, there were two other companies in Rochester that were also laying off imaging scientists, which were Kodak and Xerox. So, you know, I told my wife, I was like, you know, I'm looking for jobs, but like, this is, we got to move. If you want to see me in an imaging position, it's not going to be in Rochester, at least not now. And she loved her career. And she's like, I really don't want to move. And she's, and she reminds me, she's like, plus you bought all these investment properties over the last five years. What are you going to do with those? You can't just leave them. I said, well, you know, I can hire a manager. And so I, I explored them looking for managers. And I was just like, I don't trust any of these guys with my assets. So it was kind of like you'd expect a horror story, giving it to them. And then, you know, your unit comes back to you completely dilapidated, no rent, and maybe they've been stealing from you. That's just kind of like what the feeling that I got from these people. It wasn't very, I didn't trust them, you know, after interviewing them. Yeah. And I had this crazy idea and I just told her, I was like, look, you know, I, I love real estate. I like going to look at properties. My agent, he really doesn't like working with me. He, I mean, he sure he likes the sales, but I'm buying fifty thousand dollar houses, and I'm constantly up his butt to get into these properties. Like immediately, as soon as it lists, I'm like, I need to get in there now so I can lock this thing up, and nobody else can get it. And uh, he he just he's not able to perform the way I need him to. So why don't I just get a license as a realtor? That'll give me the ability to open the door myself, and I will go out and I will try to sell some houses. Even though if you would have asked me if I'd ever be in sales, I'd be like, absolutely not. I can't stand salespeople. So I don't really know why I decided to do that, but I was like, I'll give it a shot. And um, I went to my previous landlord, You know, he had rented to us when we were in college. He was a licensed broker. And I told him that I had just gotten licensed and I needed a place to hang my license. He said, sure, you can come on over, hang it here. So I hung my license there. You know, Obviously he wanted me to go on a team so he could rake half my commission. I was like, I can't live if you're taking half my commission. So I politely declined. I went out um, and I, the first few you know, leads I got were from my wife, from people that she worked with and they came through and I educated them through the process and I wasn't salesy. I was kind of just their friend that would open the door when they wanted me to open the door. They bought, they bought some properties. So I, I got that experience under my belt. They gave me really good feedback. They said they liked working with me. So I decided to invest in myself, take out some advertising. And then my sales just shot through the roof. You know, I'm a pretty natural converter. If somebody's going to call, I'm just going to educate them on the phone. And if they want to work with me, great. And if not, they can, that's, that's fine too. Um, and just having that approach and never really forcing anybody to sign something to work with me and just kind of showing them my value and saying, well, I mean, if I were you, I'd want to work with me because, you know, I know what I'm doing, but you know, if you don't want to, that's fine. And uh, it just worked really well. And I built a lot of relationships over the years, uh, working with investors because Rochester is just a great marketplace and I only had so much money. So, you know, I'd find a deal, take it down. And then if I don't have any cash, what do I do with the next deal that I find? I mean, I want somebody to make some money on it. So that's where I started getting a lot of investors coming through. Uh, mostly out of state too. They weren't even local and some local and they would have me help them find, identify a property, purchase it. And then, you know, they had the same fear that I did was like management. And they're like, well, you know, would you mind managing this for us? I didn't really have the capacity myself to manage it. And that's why I had started the management company and hiring some people kind of training, training them on my systems. And we just built those companies in tandem and then threw in a general contracting company to support both, both of them. Yeah, that's awesome. So I like that you just had had the, the expertise to be able to kind of take those next steps. You already had some background in real estate. You'd already invested a little bit. And, you know, the stepping into the real estate after like being a realtor, that feels like a, a natural progression for you, you know, and, and yeah. when people started coming to you, asking you to manage, you know, starting the property management company was then again, just another natural progression. Like it makes sense. It's um, you know, and so I know that you've, you've raised some money, you know, you've been on some syndications. Um, how do you determine when it's time to, to pivot, when it's time to change up the game plan a little bit, uh, maybe pursue some different opportunities? I think that's a, a difficult question to, to know. It really is a difficult question to know. You know, everybody wants to be successful. They want to get ahead and they want to make money. 
Um, and in real estate, there's so many different avenues. You can almost have like sparkling object syndrome where, you know, you're, you're chasing this, you're chasing that, and you're chasing too many different things. So as somebody that sees new people come in, uh, I see that a lot. And what I typically tell them is, you know, find something that actually works that you can repeat and just start there and build slowly. And then, um, you know, how you'll know it's time to pivot is when, the, the opportunities will come to you, right? So as I started small and just built what I was doing, I would have other people that, you know, had more cash, saw what I was doing. And they said, Hey, you know, it looks like, you know what you're doing. We've got some cash. Let's, let's figure out a way that we can find some kind of win-win uh, partnership. So I really think just doing what you can do, but being open to networking and meeting those people and helping those people, it's going to help you in the long run. So it's almost like um, organically do what you like and the rest will follow. Yeah, I like that a lot. So I know you've got a, a big project that you've been working on recently, um, you know, starting to to not only just purchase properties that are already cash flowing, but redeveloping those projects. So can you tell us a little bit about that project that you're working on right now? I'd love to hear more. Yeah. So, you know, I actually started with the BRRRR method before it became super popularized. So I'm really used to taking properties, ripping them apart and putting them back together in a way where you can regain the equity that you've got laid out. Uh, so this is the same type of situation, just on a larger scale. I purchased an office building in downtown Rochester in a time where, you know, the prices were really uh, repressed and there wasn't a lot of activity. So uh, we got into that building and then we operated out of it for a number of years, but I always knew that I wanted to reposition it as luxury apartments. Uh, but when we purchased it, there just wasn't really the market for the luxury apartments yet. And uh, we needed the space because we were growing pretty quick with the, the GC side, um, you know, and then taking on a lot of investors that were doing value add projects where they wanted us to go in and rip houses apart for them and put them back together. Uh, so we needed the space, we operated out of it. And um, now we got to the point where we've located a new office that, you know, we ripped it all the way down to studs, put it back together. And as we finish it, we're going to pop out of um, our previous office. We're going to convert that into 10 luxury apartments. We're going to leave some commercial space on grade for our agents to operate out of. Uh, but that's been a really fun project. You know, i picking out the finishes and the cabinets and working with the architect on the design. It's, it's been pretty rewarding. Uh, it's a lot of work, but um, you know, you go through the process, you learn a lot and um, you know, working with the lender on that type of product, which is a little bit different than you would uh, if you were doing a, a different type of value add, you know, the value adds I did previously, I would deploy a bunch of cash and then I would go to the bank and get the cash back with this project. I was able to go to the bank, get the construction finance, and then be able to convert that into perm after we get our lease up completed and we get our, our project buttoned up. That's really cool. Yeah. So how many stories is that building? Um, it's three stories. If you're not including the basement, it's four with the basement level. Is the basement parking or is that all going to be occupied space as well? No. We've got surface parking, luckily, which is a rarity for a building in downtown, which is part of the draw that I had to it when I purchased it. I've got about 23 parking spaces. I'll have 10 apartments. So each apartment will be able to lease a space if they like. I might give them two. We will reserve a few for the commercial. But there's tons yeah. of on-street parking. And in Rochester, there's so many surface lots that parking really isn't an issue. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like a pretty good parking ratio as well. You know, almost two, mm -hmm. two to every unit. Um, what I'd just love to learn more about the building itself. Is it all glass since it's an office? No. So it was actually constructed around the turn of the century and it was originally designed for a furniture manufacturing company. So it's built like a tank. It's all concrete throughout and uh, it was purchased by Passro and Associates and remodeled in the mid 80s, I think 1987. They got a hold of it. They put a new facade on it. They made the facade look vintage. So it had like some 1920 charm. Uh, but they took a building from 1920 that was just a brick warehouse and pretty ugly and they made it look nice. Uh, so we've got some pretty decent sized windows for the office, but it's definitely not all glass. There's a lot of brick and it's got that like 1920s architecture with the arches. Uh, you know, I 
was hoping that I would get some of these credits that everybody got in my district. It's about a one mile district. And uh, I went through the process and I found out that, you know, the cutoff is if your facade was put on after 1984, you're not eligible. And I was, oh, put, mine was put on in 1987. And oh. even though the facade was put on to mimic the old stuff, I was, you know, they're like, if you want to take advantage of this 40% in credit, you know, 20% state, 20% fed, um, you've got to rip your facade off. I'm like, dude, I'm going to rip it off and then it's going to be ugly. Yeah. It's going to look like an ugly brick warehouse. And the cost was just like, there's no point in doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, so unfortunately I wasn't eligible for those credits, but we're pushing forward on the development project anyway. And we, when we bought it, we weren't, we weren't expecting those credits either. You know, it had kind of something that happened after I purchased the building and I was like, oh, wow, this would be awesome. Uh, but we fought it and, you know, I challenged it and it was just, no, I got shut down. I, I had probably $30,000 in uh, consulting fees to, to go through the process. And it's, it's just like, no, you're not getting it. Oh so, man. It's one of those, one of those, you know, cost of doing business. Definitely, we also yeah. had another surprise, which was kind of interesting. Um, you know, I purchased it uh, with cash and, you know, I, I'm, I've been learning for 15 years. You're always learning. And I assumed that uh, when I purchased it, you know, they had a phase one that was complete and, and everything was good. And so when I bought it, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to need to get a phase one. You know, I'll get, when I get the phase one, I'll be good. Just like they were. Cause you know, they did a development, they were occupying it. I didn't see any concerns for phase two. And uh, when I went to my bank, they had the phase one, they said, oh, you've got these tanks in the parking lot that you need to remove. I'm like, why do I have to remove these tanks if Passero didn't have to remove them? They did a complete redevelopment of the building you know, back in the 80s. They're so like, oh, well, you know, regulations have changed. And when they did it, it was okay to have these tanks buried in the ground filled with water. But by today's standards, no, you can't do that. So you need to dig up the tanks, have all the water removed and then tested and processed properly. And then you got to remove the tanks, fill it back in. Uh, and this is while the interest rates were just skyrocketing around everybody. And they won't let me lock my rate until this project is done. And oh, no. I'm calling the uh, environmental every day. I'm like, guys, you got to get this done for me so I can lock my rate. Yeah. And I, you know, I probably lost two two points on my uh, interest rate dealing with this uh, this freaking phase one issue. At least two points. Man, yeah, that's unfortunate. Well, it's it's good that you're going to be able to move into some longer term debt in the near future. So what's what's the plan? Is this a a long term hold strategy? Or are you going to be yeah. hoping to sell it at some point? No, I'm a buy and hold guy. Like, I don't think I'll ever change. I just like, I like owning real estate. I like holding it. You know, I've seen what's happened with the stuff that I've bought and hold held. The um, the only few buildings that I've sold, you know, like honestly, in hindsight, I would have just kept them. I've done a, a few flips in more affluent areas where obviously they don't really make a very good hold position. So those, sure, I can sell those. But like anything that, would have been good as a rental with cash flow. I'm like, why in the world did I sell that? It was stupid. I should have kept it and just cash flowed it. You know, why not? So no, I'm I'm total buy and hold. So if it makes sense fundamentally, which is you know, the stuff that I put in my portfolio to hold, it does. You know, I underwrite conservatively. And mm -hmm. why would I sell it? I've already done all the hard work, you know. No. Passive investors in real estate are able to receive a check every month. Some people call that mailbox money. We say money really does grow on trees. Visit the website at biggerpictureholdings.com where we have a ton of free resources to help you learn more about planting your very own money tree. A few more questions for you. One, I'd just like to hear, you know, obviously you, you're thinking about real estate differently. So you, you looked at a, a building, you know, maybe low level occupancy or or not even occupied at all. And you you had a, a vision to create it and make it into something that was very usable. Um what's what's that thought process? Like how are you looking at buildings? You know, what are you thinking about as you as you see real estate? I'm looking at areas. So I'm always looking for areas that have that are undervalued in my opinion and that have the possibility and the probability of changing in a shorter time horizon. Than most people expect. So when I purchased that building, you know, I could see that, you know, there were going to be some, some resurgences in that area just because of the way it's positioned ge ge geographically, you know, our downtown is pretty big. And I knew that I wanted to be in a particular part of downtown. I wasn't looking all over downtown. I wasn't looking over on the West side at all. 
you know, I sure I'd evaluate deals, but unless it was like some kind of screaming deal, I really didn't want to park my cash there. I wanted to be over on the side that tied in with our A class neighborhoods. And I really hit the nail on the head because, you know, since I purchased, they've infilled the inner loop, which, you know, I'd have to check, but I don't think that project was announced when I purchased it. I just kind of had the the foresight. Um, you know, I'm near a university, so I knew that I was protected as far as rents went and and occupancy and getting a decent tenant. Uh, but since I purchased it, we've had this massive infill of a piece of highway that used to circle the the set of the city. Yeah. Sitter Sunny Cor- Sitter <laughs> City Center Core. And they've filled it in. They've RFP'd, which is request for proposal to developers, and they've all put up um, mixed use buildings, you know, with commercial on grade for the most part and uh, residential on top. So that's been a boon. And that has bridged, you know, that was kind of like a moat between our class A and our downtown. And a lot of people in the class A just didn't walk over because you had a couple blocks of just like ugliness. And it kind of kept us segregated. But now that it's all been filled in, we have a nice area that's walkable and it's kind of included our section of the city as that as that walkable part. And um, you know, now today we've got a, a lot of other developers that are doing the doing this on a massive scale. They're taking like legacy buildings, like the, the Xerox Tower has been converted. They call it Innovation Square. And, you know, there's a lot of apartments, there's student housing, but then there's also space to be creative. You know, we went to my son's uh, birthday uh, last week. There, One of the penthouse floors has been converting it, converted into like a gaming studio. Uh, so wow. we went there and, you know, great, great views. And so there's a lot of that happening. The Boston Loan Building, the Metropolitan, Tower 280, uh, the Sibley Building. So since I purchased, there's a lot of really high-powered developers that have come into the area that are repurposing some of that vacant office space, turning it into uh, mix, mixed use, you know, predominantly market rate with some subsidy. And that's really going to help the cityscape and it's really going to lift all those values. You know, we're still in the process. It's, it's a lot better than it was when I moved in, but I think we still have a long way to go as well. That's awesome, man. I'm excited for that project. Can't wait to, to hear more um, as you wrap that up. So I know we've already talked about a few lessons you had talked about uh, Mm -hmm. the, the phase one environmental reporting and just some of the obstacles that that has um, associated with it and how I can, you know, mess up projects. Is there any other lessons that you'd love to share with listeners today? Yeah. I mean, you only make money when you buy and you can't change the location. You know, there's very cliche sayings, but um, if you base your fundamental buy decisions around those, you're, you're going to do well. Uh, So I have a lot of investors that might not be as um, cautious when it comes to those things. And you can't, you know, you can't change your location once you get it, you're stuck with it. So if you end up choosing something that's in a more speculative or risky type area, you're stuck with that. And, you know, if you don't like it, your only choice is to sell. And I tell people like, when you get into real estate, don't expect to sell soon and make any money. You'll probably lose some money. And especially if you're chasing cash flow properties, you know, this is like minimum of five years. And even that is a little risky. You know, I want to see you in this thing for 10, 15 years to make sure that you're going to do well on your exit. And a lot of those investors, you know, they'll come, they'll listen to what I have to say. They'll, I'll explain to them how I do it. You know, I'm, I'm more of a middle of the road guy. I'm going to trade off my cash flow to get a better location. I'm okay with that. And um, a lot of them won't listen. You know, they'll go into the more risky areas because the cash flow looks better. And then it's a couple, two, three, five years later, they're like, I don't want to own this thing anymore. It's bleeding cash. I keep getting these you know, evictions and these people are trashing my units and then you guys got to go in and turn them over. And it's like five grand to turn it over. It's like, why am I doing this? Like, yeah, you know, it's, it comes with the territory. Maybe you should have went more towards the middle of the road. Like I advised you at the beginning and traded some of that, that cash flow to get a decent asset where we can get you a better Mm -hmm. tenant and you're not having those problems. So a lot of investors that that don't heed that advice of you know location and um, you know specifically condition when you buy are going to pay the price. They're not going to be in it for the long haul. They're going to end up liquidating, you know, probably right when they should be hunkering down and, and keeping it. You know, they've they've gone through the the hardest the process. You know, there's going to be a few years when you purchase something that you're you're getting it dialed in. You're getting it up to speed. You know, you're probably going to have some capex, especially if you're going for these uh, cash flow neighborhoods. Just 
that's part of the game. Like you've got to do that. If that's the road that you're taking, you just have to expect that, you know, you might not see a return for the first five years. Once you get it dialed in, you know, you look back after you've owned it for 15, 20 years. Now you're like, okay, I'm, I'm proud of myself. I made a good decision. A lot of these guys dump it after they've done the hard work. They go the five years and then they dump it. It's like, guys, you did. the next guy is going to thank you because you've done a lot of heavy lifting for him to get, get it to this point where now you should be really thinking about, okay, if I'm about stabilized and I can just operate this thing and make a little bit of money and they just, they can't, they just, they, they're like, no, it's, it's been five years. I'm not, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm done. And then they dump it and, you know, they don't really make any, they might get out clean usually after five years, but they, they didn't make any money. They just wasted a lot of time and had a lot of frustration and got a bad taste uh, about real estate when they could have had an excellent taste. Yeah, man. I appreciate you sharing that, you know, and, you know, you mentioned like just good construction. So I, I've been touring several properties recently, you know, trying to submit offers and get something under contract. And I toured a property yesterday. And, you know, I always like Google Maps it, you know, do a, a virtual drive by and just look at it and stuff. And, you know, I could tell that the roofs needed repaired, you know, and that's not a, in my eyes, that's not a big deal. You know, you raise additional money to get that CapEx, CapEx done. But one thing that I, I noticed, you know, my background is in construction management. So I helped to build a 26 story building. So I have a keen eye for, you know, good construction, uh, good maintenance. And I, after touring the property, I wasn't excited about it. You know, it's a 40 year old property and it has, you know, good plumbing, uh, but ultimately like it was not maintained well on the exterior. Like there's a lot of wood rot, you know, there was some actually leaking in some of the units, like you could see in the, there was some, you know, drywall patches and stuff. And I think it's just like those types of properties, like it really concerned me because I think that there's going to be skeletons in the closet, you know, so not only do I want to buy something that's going to be well constructed, but you know, I want to see that it's been maintained properly. You know, I'm, I'm not afraid mm -hmm. to do renovations and, and things like that. But, you know, these these properties, you know, when they're millions of dollars, potentially, I, I don't want to take a chance on buying something that's subpar. I want to be excited about it, you know? Yeah, for sure. Well, my last question for you, Mark, is what is your proudest accomplishment so far? I was just having the family, you know, we waited a little while to start having kids. So we're the older parents, but, uh, so glad that we did. It's so re rewarding and just being able to, you know, coach those youngsters and teach them, you know, the way that my parents taught me and, and raise them. And it's fun to see, you know, that the, the lessons do sink in and they're appreciative and they're using their manners and, you know, it's, sure we have to coach them still and we'll have to coach them forever but it's just it's really fulfilling to to listen to your kids yeah i love that man that's so awesome well how can people get in touch with you mark so my cell is 585-314-9790 585-314-9790 if you shoot me a text i will give you my calendly link that's probably the best way you know i get so many emails I'm at raisecapital.com, R-A-Z-E capital.com. If they want to go there, that's that's fine as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining today, Mark. It's been fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Like and subscribe below. A new episode will air every Tuesday at 7 a.m. Are you looking for more content? Visit our website, biggerpictureholdings.com. And remember, money really does grow on trees.